Good morning. Today is Tuesday, the 15th of September, and today we commemorate and celebrate St. Cyprian, Bishop of Carthage and Martyr, who died in 258 AD. Our opening sentence today comes from Psalm 19, verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my Redeemer. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And apart from your grace, there is no health in us. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare all those who confess their faults. Restore all those who are penitent according to your promises, declared to all people in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may now live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you absolution and remission of all your sins, true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of his Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. O come, let us adore him. O come, let us sing unto the Lord, let us heartily rejoice in the strength of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and show ourselves glad in him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are all the depths of the earth and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands prepared the dry land. O come, let us worship and fall down and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation, and as in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me and put me to the proof, though they had seen my works. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation and said, It is a people that err in their hearts, for they have not known my ways, of whom I swore in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. O come, let us adore him. The appointed psalm for today is Psalm 40. I wait patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my call. He brought me out of the horrible pit, out of the mire and clay. He set my feet upon the rock, and secured my footing. He has put a new song in my mouth, a song of thanksgiving unto our God. Many shall see and fear, and shall put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who has set his hope in the Lord, and has not turned to the proud or to those who go about lying. O Lord my God, great are the wondrous works which you have done, and also your thoughts towards us. There is none who can be compared with you. If I should declare them and speak of them, they would be more than I am able to express. Sacrifice and offering you do not desire, but my ears you have opened. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you have not required. And so I had said, Behold, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me that I delight to do your will, O my God, indeed. Your law is within my heart. I have declared your righteousness in the great congregation. 
Behold, I will not restrain my lips, O Lord, and that you know. I have not hidden your righteousness within my heart. My talk has been of your truth and of your salvation. I have not concealed your loving mercy and truth from the great congregation. Withdraw not your mercy from me, O Lord. Let your loving kindness and your truth always preserve me. For innumerable troubles have encompassed me. My sins have taken such hold of me that I am not able to look up. Indeed, they are more to, in number than the hairs of my head, and my heart has utterly failed me. O Lord, let it be your pleasure to deliver me. Make haste, O Lord, to help me. Let those be ashamed and confounded who seek after my soul to destroy it. Let them be driven backward and rebuked who wish me evil. Let them become desolate and rewarded with the shame who say to me, Aha! Aha! Let all those who seek you be joyful and glad in heart, and let those who love your salvation say always, The Lord be praised! As for me, I am poor and needy, but the Lord cares for me. You are my helper and deliverer. Do not tarry, O oh my God. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. We continue with our epistle from Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11 through 620. And I remind you that the author of Hebrews is pointing out the supremacy of Christ, Jesus. Jesus is greater than the angels. Jesus is greater than Moses and all of the prophets. Jesus is greater than the Old Testament priesthood. He is the offering of salvation to us. And today continues that theme of Jesus being greater than the Old Testament priesthood. But it starts today with a warning against falling, falling away. And that's important as we remember St. Cyprian today, who was very much living in a time where people indeed faced real persecution and many fell away. They were called the lapsi, like the word lapsed. They fell away from the faith. And then some of them wanted to return. And there was a great debate on the, what they had to do in order to return back to the faith. We take our confession, our penance, if you will, kind of lightly today. We, we say confession every day, and we need to. I'm not critical of that. But we need to realize that it's not just saying magical words. There always needs to be a reformation of the heart. So that when we say, we have sinned, O Lord, against you and our neighbor, it needs to be a sincere regret for that sin and a sincere desire with the aid of the Holy Spirit to turn and to live into the fullness of faith. And so Cyprian was one of those who said, if you're going to come back into the church, you need to make a public profession of sorrowfulness. You renounced your faith publicly. You signed a script saying, I renounce my faith. And it was recorded. And so if you're going to reject your rejection of Christ, you need to do that publicly also before you're admitted. It's not just a matter of saying, I'm sorry, like a child who gets caught. And just the standard answer is, I'm sorry, I won't do that again until the next time. The, the seriousness Cyprian wanted to highlight, but at the same time, not deny um, forgiveness. Uh, we have a, a modern day 20th century writer uh, who was a martyr in the church who spoke about how faith, excuse me, how grace is not cheap. It cost God his son, and his son suffered on the cross. Grace is free to us. But it's not cheap. And we cheapen it, or we attempt to cheapen it, when we treat it casually. Well, let's continue now with the reading from Hebrews. And I'll tell you a little bit more about Cyprian in a minute or two. 
About this we have much to say, and it is hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you against uh, again. We, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child, but solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God and of instruction against washings, that is baptism, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits, for it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up in contempt. For land has, that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it's worthless and near to being cursed, and in the end it is burned. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater to whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desires to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. For we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain, where Jesus is gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our canticle is a song to the Lamb, Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Splendor and honor and kingly power are yours by right, O Lord our God. For you created everything that is, and by your will they were created and have their being. And yours by right, O Lamb that was slain, for with your blood you have redeemed for God from every family, language, people, and nation a kingdom of priests to serve our God. And so to him who sits on the throne and to Christ the Lamb, be worship and praise, dominion and splendor forever and forevermore. Uh, the word, uh, amen. Uh, let us uh, pray. Heavenly Father, send your Holy Spirit into our midst. Enkindle and strengthen our faith. Help us to mature in that faith through the grace of the Holy Spirit and through spiritual practices of worship, uh, spiritual disciplines of reading our scriptures, studying together, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, living out the gospel, being the gospel of Christ to others. And may we rely not on our works, which are of uh, unworthy except in, when used by you for your glory, 
We are saved by grace, O oh Lord, and help us to appreciate that grace, not by cheapening it or seeking to evade it or deny it, but to receive your grace and pass it on to others in your name. Amen. A little bit more reflection uh, on today as we celebrate the Feast of St. Cyprian, as we reflect on the reading from Hebrews, as we reflect on the reading from Psalm 40 today. Blessed is the man, the one who has set his hope in the Lord, who has not turned to the proud or those who go about lying. That's verse 5. Uh, they, there is that wonderful um, teaching here. You, you know, sometimes we hear that our faith, and we'll say this sometimes, and it's erroneous, and we need to be corrected and made aware that it's erroneous if we say, well, you know, my faith is private. There's no such thing as a Christian. There's no such thing as an Old Testament follower of God. Look at the psalm today. Verse 11, verse 12 of Psalm 40. I have declared your righteousness in the great congregation. Behold, I will not restrain my lips, O Lord, and that you know. I have not hidden your kindness within my heart, my personal religion. I have not hidden my your I have not hidden your righteousness within my heart. My talk has been of your truth and of your salvation. Verse 13. I have not concealed your loving loving mercy and truth from the great congregation. You see, there's that call, even in the Old Testament there, of a proclamation of being an apostle of the greatness and the mighty works of God. There's no such thing as a private religion as Christians are concerned, or as the Old Testament Jews are concerned. We're called to be witnesses of the Lord God Almighty, who, cre who knew us, who created us, and who sustains us, and who redeems us through His Son. And so today, that warning against falling away from the faith, you, you heard it when I, uh, I, I actually started off with the Venite today, and I continued uh, with that part that I, I, is often over, uh, omitted Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, as in the day of temptation in the wilderness, referring to those in the wilderness during the Exodus who rebelled against God, who rebelled against Moses, God's appointed leader. And so it goes on to say, when your fathers tested me and put me to the proof, though they had seen my works. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation and said, they are people that err in their hearts. They have not known my ways of whom I swore in my wrath they should not enter into my rest, and they didn't. Those unfaithful people died before they got into the promised land. That whole generation, with the exception of just a few, Joshua, uh, Caleb, uh, the rest died. Those who were unfaithful, they were not allowed to go into the promised land, just their children. And so we need to be aware that our, uh, the, the falling away is dangerous uh, it's dangerous to our soul. It's dangerous, of course, to our witness. It's dangerous uh, to who we are and what we might become. And the, the author of Hebrews is, is very clear about that. In fact, he is very strong. As Paul is so strong in uh, affirming the, the calling of those who have become Christ, the election, if you will, if you are a Christian, if you have become a Christian, you are part of God's elect. You're his chosen his priesthood of believers, you need not worry about that. That's a very strong teaching. Uh, it's not talking about those who are in and those who are out. He's offering assurance to those who may be persecuted, may be wondering, am I, am I saved? And the answer is, if you, are, uh, if you have confessed Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, you are saved. Well, here in Hebrews, there's a warning about those who have known the salvation and then have walked away and rejected it. Now, we want to be careful not to hang our whole faith on just this one section here, because if it does, it sounds like this is the unforgivable sin, to be a Christian and walk away from our faith, and then it sounds like you're forever damned. But how many times does Jesus say we're to forgive the, our brother who has sinned against us? Seventy-seven times infinity. And so God's mercy, while not cheap, it cost him everything, his grace, is everlasting and eternal. He's true to his promises. And so those who come and turn to him with sincere faith, uh, truly hearts that say, I am sorry, I, 
they are welcome back into the church. That's what Cyprian was struggling with. Uh, he was struggling with the, the challenge to not cheapen grace or attempt to cheapen grace by saying, oh, well, you burned incense to the emperor. Um, you were threatened with your life. It's okay. Come back and receive communion Sunday. It's, it's cool. And he said, no, no, you've got to have a public, as you publicly denied your Savior, you need to publicly repent of that denial and publicly be admitted back into the church. It's, it's not just as simple as, oh, Never mind, it, it didn't happen. It did. And people use that to attack the church. So Cyprian did not close the door, <laughs> but he, 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 made, he, he tried to honor the scriptures who talk about the forgiveness, but also talk about the dangers of falling away and not cheapening or attempting to cheapen grace. So here we have a teaching from Hebrews about that, but we also have in the reading today the certainty of God's promises. God gave an oath. He swore, he has no greater person to swear by but himself. I solemnly swear that the truth I tell you, God swears by his own authority. You and I place our hands on a Bible or we place, uh, raise our hand and say, I, I affirm uh, this oath that I'm giving. And I understand the cost of perjury if I lie, that sort of thing. But here God gives the certainty of his promise to Abraham and those who follow as heirs and children of Abraham, of which we are heirs and children of Abraham in the faith, trusting in Jesus as our Christ, our Messiah. Back to the point of this letter, this epistle, Jesus is superior to the angels. He's superior uh, to, to Moses and the prophets. He's superior uh, to the Old Testament priesthood. He is the fullness of the revelation of God. And so that's part of uh, who we have. And so we have the conclusion. Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, the ascension into heaven, having become the high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And I spoke about Melchizedek yesterday, and there's readings tomorrow, I think it is, uh, that will talk more about Melchizedek. So I'm going to leave that alone. I want to talk a little bit about Cyprian because I've mentioned him. Cyprian lived in Carthage. Um, he was... Uh, he was martyred. He, he died in the faith. Um, he is known for several writings. One is on the unity of the universal church, uh, at which I'm going to read a, a quote out of that, talking about the unity of the church. And he uses metaphor here. He says, as there are many rays of the sun, but one light, and many branches of a tree, but one strength based on its uh, tenacious root, and since from one spring flow many streams, although the multiplicity uh, seems diffused in the liberality of an abundant, flowing abundance, yet the unity is still preserved in the source. Separate a ray of the sun from its body of light. It does not allow division of light. Break a branch from the tree when broken. It will not uh, be able to bud, cut off uh, the stream from its fountain and that which it is cut off dries up. Thus also the church shone over with the light of the Lord sheds forth her rays over the whole world. Yet it is one light which is everywhere diffused, not, nor is the unity of the body separated. Her fruitful abundance spreads her branches over the whole world. She, the church, broadly expands her rivers, liberally flowing, yet her head is one, her source one, and she is one mother, plentiful in the results of fruitfulness. From her womb we are born, by her milk we are nourished, by her spirit we are animated. And who is the head of the church? Jesus. It flows back the unity of the church is the good news of Jesus Christ. So that's a reading from Cyprian on the unity of the universal church. And I mentioned um, that he is uh, from uh, Bishop of, uh, of uh, uh, Cyprian of Carthage. Um, he was martyred there and he was a, a, an attorney, he was a lawyer. And interestingly, we have actually a part of the record of his trial. Um, that was on September the 14th. And it starts off by identifying his name, uh, his given name, uh, Tarchius. And so the question by 
of the judge uh, is, uh, are you Tarsus? The bishop replied, Cyprian, yes, I am. Galerius, who is the judge, the reverend emperors ordered you to perform the religious rites. Bishop, I will not. Galerius, take care. Bishop, do as you have ordered. There is no need for deliberation. Then Galerius consulted with his colleagues and said, quote, Since you have set yourself as an enemy of the gods of Rome and of other religious practices, the emperors could not be able to bring you back to the observance of their sacred laws, and also you are an instigator and leader of a foremost atrocious crime. Uh, Tarsius Cyprian was sentenced to die by the sword. And the bishop's response, thanks be to God. And he was immediately taken out and beheaded. That's a copy of the trial transcript uh, of Cyprian, uh, who was uh, condemned to death for his failure uh, to burn incense and to renounce his faith and promise to um, worship the emperor and the gods of Rome. Now here's something to think about. The writer to Hebrews warns about being immature in the faith and talks about the basics of the faith. But he says, you know, you need to mature. You need to grow up. And I'm disappointed you haven't. You're still babies in the faith. You're just, you're drinking mother's milk and you need to be eating solid food by now. One of my concerns for us in the church is from Sunday to Sunday for basically one hour of worship a week, we give these little homilies and we're constricted in our amount of time that we can give. I noticed from Facebook, the average listening time for our 40 minute or so morning prayer is 12 minutes. I mean, people turn out after 12 minutes. But my friends, how in the world can we worship God and be nurtured in the faith and grow in the faith if we give 12 minutes to God, if we give just an hour to God, and then out of that hour, well, okay, uh, give us a 10-minute sermon, that's it. That's all we want to hear. That's basically saying, I want to drink mother's milk every Sunday. I never want to grow. And the church offers Sunday school, but a large number of people don't come. And of course, now with the pandemic, morning prayers, an attempt of mine to offer Christian education through worship uh, on a daily basis. But, you know, the, the danger is, is we get content and we get lazy and we just like mother's milk. But we're called to grow in the faith, to study God's word, to worship the Lord, to do acts of goodness and charity to others, to live out the life, to, as the psalmist reminds us from the Old Testament, to be witnesses to the mighty acts and deeds of God. And in order to do that, we need to know the scriptures. We need to live the life. We need to give an authentic witness. And, and that's hard work. You know, being a Christian is not easy. Cyprian gave his life simply because he wouldn't burn a little incense and say, I renounce Christian Christ and, I, and I, I worship the emperor as God and I worship the Roman gods. Here's my incense. Poof. And get a little script and walk away. That's why the, his trial judge said, take care. <laughs> You know, be careful, you're, you're stepping into a death sentence here. And he did it willingly because he was mature in the faith. Well, let's continue in that maturity by reciting together the Apostles' Creed, a foundational statement. It's got to be lived out, but we've got to work with the basics and the foundation, but we have to build on top of those. We can't just say, this is enough. I believe in God, the Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. 
Amen. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, show your mercy upon us. Grant us your salvation. O Lord, guide those who govern us and lead us in the way of justice and truth. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Let your people sing with joy. O Lord, save your people and bless your inheritance. Give peace in our time, O Lord, and defend us by your mighty power. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and take not your Holy Spirit from us. The prayer of the, of the day from this past Sunday. O God, because without you we are not able to please you, mercifully grant that by your Holy Spirit we may in all things direct that that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And the prayer commemorating St. Cyprian, Bishop of Carthage and Martyr, 258. Almighty God, you gave your servant Cyprian boldness to confess the name of our Savior Jesus Christ before the rulers of this world and courage to die for this faith. Grant that we may always be ready to give a reason for the hope that is in us and to gladly suffer for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. And on Tuesday, our prayer is for peace. O God, the author of peace and lover of concord, to know you as eternal life and to serve you as perfect freedom. Defend us, your humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in your defense, may not fear the power of any adversaries through the might of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And the prayer for our common mission together, to pro proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, the mighty works of God. O God, you have made of one blood all the peoples of the earth, and sent your blessed Son to preach peace to those who are far off and to those who are near. Grant that people, people everywhere may seek after you and find you. Bring the nations into your fold, pour your spirit upon all flesh, and hasten the coming of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. At this time, I invite your prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings, inviting you to remember the fires out west, the Hurricane Sally that's approaching from the Gulf, for those who suffer from the pandemic, for our election process, for people who do not know Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord, whatever the Holy Spirit places on your heart, let us offer now to God, whose grace is infinite, his love forever. Pray for Jacqueline as she prepares to visit her sister, Leslie. We pray for Leslie, O oh Lord, that ease her pain and suffering. And prepare her. Pray for Joy and for Jan. For all who are sick. For all who have struggles. For the various needs of those that we know and those known only to you, O oh Lord. Especially pray for those who may be despondent, depressed, suicidal. Intervene, O Lord, and let them know that your love and you would never leave them. 
strengthen our faith and our witness and our love of you and of our neighbor. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life. But above all, but above all, for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and the hope of glory. We pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications to you. You've been, you have promised to your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will grant their requests. Fulfill now, our Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to him from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. Continuing with important things to remember from Fred Rogers, he talks about grandparents and grandparenthood, I guess you could say, or I will say. Um, it's a very short, pithy statement, just uh, two sentences but I want to share it with you and I'm going to read it a little slow and I may read it twice just so that it can sink in since you don't have the written word in front of you. Fred Rogers. Grandparents are both our past and our future. In some ways they are what has gone before and in others they are what we will become. Grandparents are both our past and our future. In some ways, they are what has gone before, and in others, they are what we will become. You think about transmitting the faith. Some of us may have not known our grandparents. Some of us may not have children per se. But within the body of Christ and the family of God united through Jesus, there are a whole bunch of kids out there. And I invite you to and challenge you to think how you might be a grandparent to a child that may even not be your blood relation by being an encourager, by being a witness of the faith, by being one who listens and just says, hey, kiddo, how you doing? God willing, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Have a blessed day.